Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about Cisco Trusec. This should be one of a few videos I do on Cisco Trusec. So let's start out by talking about what is Cisco Trusec. There's a sort of complicated answer to that. So the short answer, answer is that initially it was defined as an architecture comprising of several technologies, but most of the time people think of security group tags when they think of Trusec. There is a longer answer though. When you look at the Cisco documentation for Trussec, there's several components. There's a centralized policy management and a distributed policy enforcement as, as well as micro segmentation, which is provided by those security group tags. There's a component that gives us confidentiality and integrity. What that is is MacSec, which essentially provides encryption based on 802.1 AE, which gives us AES GCM 128 bit encryption. Uh, that does wire rate hop by hop layer two encryption and the key management is based on 802.11 n and the last part is an authenticated networking environment so not only endpoint endpoints are authenticated to the network but the network devices themselves are are actually authenticated based on 802.1 x which creates a trusted networking environment So understanding what Trussec is, let's dig into common ter terminology really quickly. Let's start by defining some key terms that you'll need to know for Cisco Trussec. The first one is a security group. This is used for grouping users, endpoints, and resources that should have similar access control policies together. Based on the security group, we assign a security group tag. This is a unique security group number that's assigned to the security group. A TrustSec capable device is a network access device that's capable hardware and software wise of understanding, applying, and using security group tags. A TrustSec C device is a network access device that authenticates directly against ICE and acts as both an authenticator and supplicant for other network access devices in the TrustSec cloud. Network device admission control is where in a TrustSec cloud, network devices are verified with credentials by peer devices. This is done by 802.1x using EatFast, and upon authentication and authorization, it negotiates for 802.1 AE encryption. One thing we'll see often are protected access credentials or PACs in a TrustSec fabric. They're unique shared credentials used to mutually authenticate client and server. And in this case, we'll definitely see them on this network access device to ICE. Endpoint authentication control is where devices authenticate to the network via 802.1x, Easy Connect, MAB, WebAuth, or whatever else. Security Group Access Control Lists, or SGACL. These grant access and permissions based on SGTs, not IP addresses or subnets. This greatly simplifies the security policy instead because it doesn't have long IP-based ACLs, and you're able to see what should be talking to what based on that tag and the tag name, so HR to uh, marketing, for example. Security Exchange Protocol, or SXP. This is a service that's used to propagate IP to SGT bindings across network devices that don't support SGTs. Think of it as kind of like propagating your routes using BGP across a provider's private MPLS. This is just getting those, those IP to SGT routes, so to speak, to, uh, to the other side. The Environment Data Download. This is a download from ICE to the network access device when it joins the trusted network. When it does this, it downloads the following. The ICE RADIUS server list it can use for future RADIUS authentications and authorizations. The device itself's SGT, so the SGT for that network access device. And the expiry timeout. This is, is basically how often the NAD should download or refresh the environmental data. And last, the identity to port mapping. 
This is basically the, where the switch defines the identity on a port and uses this identity to look up a particular SGT value that should be assigned from ICE. Now that we've gone over some of the terminology, let's talk about why TrustSec for a moment. We should know the problems that we're trying to solve before we dig into it further. Let me pull up my whiteboard. Imagine a branch of an enterprise where you have three different types of users. We have Bob from HR, Catherine from IT, and Diane from Design. Each should be allowed access to a certain core common services like DHCP, Active Directory, so on, but each team has different, a different set of requirements for what they should be allowed to have access to on the network. For example, the HR team needs to have access to the internal HR servers and file shares. However, for the sake of security, people on the HR team should not be able to directly connect or communicate with each other's PCs. For Diane, she should have access to the application servers her team uses for design, and her team also uses a peer-to-peer -peer file share application, which means their computer should be able to communicate via a special port for that application. Let's go ahead and call it TCP 6555. In Catherine's case, she's in IT, so she needs access to servers and network devices via RDP and SSH. She also needs to be able to communicate with certain security servers and applications via TCP 443. When we think about how we're going to create this level of segmentation, what are our options? We can segment each type of user via VLAN. To limit east-west access within a VLAN, we could utilize a combination of VLAN ACLs and for north-south communication, ACLs on the SVI. This would need to be based on IP addresses and subnets, though. The problem with this is that depending on the size of the environment or how many services are needed, the VACLs and Layer 3 ACLs can become incredibly complicated quickly, especially if they're not centrally managed. If you added another branch, you would need to go through e each and every switch in your environment and update the ACLs and VACLs with, with the new corresponding subnets. Now imagine if you had 100 plus branches in your environment and the size of the ACL, uh, the ACL and VACL on every switch. Another way to go about the VLAN approach is to use private VLANs, but once again, this is limited. You can let them talk to everyone in the same private VLAN group, or you can restrict access to all east-west traffic. The only way to restrict access in a community v private VLAN is to apply another VACL, which goes back to the previous issue we'd have, and we'd still have another ACL on the Layer 3 boundary to limit that north-south communication. Another potential solution we could utilize is downloadable ACLs. This would solve the problem of not having centrally managed ACLs, but the scalability issues still apply. With downloadable ACLs, we'll, we're limited based on our TCAM space. For example, if we have an environment with 50 to 100 branches and you need to allow all the design folks to be able to communicate with each other or allow all the IT folks to be able to communicate with even more network devices, we can see how this could quickly max out the TCAM sp space just based on the size of the ACL alone with all the subnets. On top of that, every time a user connects, the downloadable ACL is downloaded for each user. Even if the same type of user is connecting to the switch, they're getting and they're getting the same downloadable ACL. Basically, apply, downloads the same ACL twice if there's two users, and then applies it to each port. Even if any of these methods could scale, it's not exactly user-friendly or intuitive. When you look at a long ACL or VACL, it's complex and trying to understand what should or should not be blocked is complicated because it's based on IP or subnet. At its core, these are the problems that using SGTs hope to solve. Instead of looking at it from an IP-based or VLAN-based world, we're identifying these users based on a security group. We can have a security group for HR, another for design, and another for IT, and create a policy for how these groups should be able to communicate with each other and with themselves. When each user type connects to the network, they're assigned a security group tag that's based on the security group that they're in. To visualize this a little bit better, let's say our HR group has an SGT tag of 5. Our design group gets an SGT tag of 6, while our IT group gets an SGT tag of 7. Using those security group tags, we could define a security group policy which 
which states what security groups should be allowed to talk to which security groups and on which ports. That would be all included in one security group policy, which would be downloaded to the switch once. So in a TrustSec world, when Bob connects to the network, his packets are now tagged with a security group tag of five, while does Diane gets a tagged with a security group tag of six, and Catherine gets tagged with a security group of seven. The switch will have downloaded the security group policy once instead of applying it port by port or authentication by authentication. It can make the decision without looking at the overhead of VACLs or DACLs or ACLs. For example, if Bob tries to connect to Diane's computer, the switch will simply look at the security group tag on port 1 where Bob is and the tag on port 2 where Diane is and reference the security policy in its database that it downloaded from ICE. Based on this policy, it will allow or block the traffic, even within the same VLAN. Without having huge IP-based ACLs or VACLs, we're no longer running into scalability issues where we max out the TCAM table or have to continuously update the ACLs. Instead, if we add a new site, ICE can continue tagging users in that site based on what security group they are in, and the switches will just download that security group policy. Going past just network access control, though, there are other uses for SGTs, which is why SGTs are sometimes referred to as scalable group tags. For example, some of the other use cases that can be configured include QoS based on SGT, policy based routing based on SGT, zone based firewalling based on SGT, IPS policy based on SGT, proxy policy based on SGT, and much more. And with that, we've come to the end of our, ICE, our first TrustSec video, and thank you so much for watching.